Well, basically, they're both threshold algorithms. So what we've been talking about in the other videos is super threshold testing and screening. So we're now moving into an area where we're talking about threshold testing, where we're trying to get an accurate measurement of the extent of defects. So these are the type of tests that are used to monitor patients who have established loss, loss already, they've got a field defect, or people at very high risk of getting loss. So, if we look at the characteristics of a field test, okay, and I've listed the three characteristics here, okay, the first characteristic is where are the stimuli? Okay, if you look at CETA and ZATA, they use exactly the same test locations. So there's no difference between them at the moment. There's one small difference. Um, when you do a field test, the most common one for glaucoma is called a 24-2. So this tests the central 24 degrees with a square distribution matrix of stimuli. There is another test called a 30-2, and the 30-2 is the same as the 24-2, except it goes out to 30 degrees rather than stopping at 24. The important thing to realize is in a 30-2, it includes all the points of a 24-2, plus a few extras. So in a lot of perimeters, you opt at the beginning to do a 24-2, or you opt to do a 30-2. In a Henson, they're combined. It starts off doing a 24-2, and if at any stage during the examination or at the end, you want to test the additional points, you just press a button on the screen and it will automatically add the extra points. So it's a combined test. It doesn't make you force you into the decision before you've started the test. You can see the results coming out and say, maybe I should have done a 30-2, press the button and it will collect the extra data. The other characteristic of a field test is the type of stimuli that you use. So we can use white stimuli and white backgrounds, which are sometimes called SAP perimetry or standard automated perimetry. We can use blue stimuli and yellow backgrounds, which is called SWAP for short wavelength automated perimetry. We can use gratings, we can use lines, we can use all sorts of things. CETA and ZATA use white on white backgrounds. Okay, so the same size stimulus on the same background luminance for both programs. So as far as the positioning is the same, as far as the type of stimuli they are the same, the way they differ is just in the algorithm that they use. If we look at threshold testing through the ages, as it were, we can see the first threshold tests appeared in the 1970s. They were developed by two Swiss ophthalmologists for the octopus perimeter. And they called this test a full threshold test. It was a staircase threshold test. Okay? And it took a long time before that was improved upon uh, by a group of Bengtsson and Olsen in Sweden and they produced the Swedish interactive thresholding algorithm which is based upon a zest algorithm that was developed by psychophysicists. So some psychophysicists who were interested not in perimetry but in finding thresholds came up with this idea that a better and faster way to find a threshold was by doing it this way rather than using staircase methods. So the Swedes adopted this zest algorithm for perimetry and produced a threshold in algorithm that is much faster than the full threshold but just as accurate. So the important thing to realize is that if you've got a CETA algorithm there is really no point in doing a full threshold test. You'll get just as much data in less time just as accurate by doing CETA. Now, CETA came out in 1998, so this is, what, 15 years ago. And in the 15 years that have happened since then, you know, we've learned a lot more about glaucoma, a lot more about the problems of detecting it, etc. And so Zata builds upon CETA using the same basic Zest algorithms, but going a little stage further. And let me so show you how it does this. So, on this slide here, at the bottom, I've got an example of a staircase test. So this is the threshold, this red line here of the patient. So if we present a stimulus up here, a bright stimulus, it's above the threshold so the patient will see it. 
So the algorithm would be present this light, it's seen, make it dimmer, present it again, 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 seen, make it dimmer, it's gone below the threshold, it won't be seen, and we can say, ah, oh, the threshold lies between five and the sixth presentation they didn't see. So it's taken us six presentations. If we got the threshold estimate closer at the beginning, you can see one presentation, two presentations missed. It only took three presentations. So the message I'm trying to get over here is that if you can start closer to their threshold, it will require less presentations to find the threshold. So we call this prior data. What do we know about the patient that we can use so as we start off closer? Well, we know their threshold goes down with age, so we put the age in, right? But the best bit of information is their previous field test. If we've already tested them, remember, when we're doing threshold tests where we're monitoring patients over time, we've probably got half a dozen records from them. If we use the pre previous record as a starting point, we're going to be very close to their thresholds because patients don't change a massive amount between visits. It's very subtle changes sometimes. So Zata will always use prior data from the previous field test if it's available. So when you start the program off, it says, is this a new patient? You say, no. It opens up the database. You select the last record and press load, and it starts off from those values. So the first step is better use of prior data making the test faster, less presentations. This flowchart here gives you an idea of how the algorithm works. Okay, So we would start the test. From the prior data, you'd estimate the threshold. You then say, is my estimate accurate enough? Well, on the first time round, you'd probably say, no. So it's not accurate enough. So I'm going to present a stimulus, carefully calculated to be close to their threshold, right? I'm then going to say, all right, now with this information, they saw or missed this light, I'm going to re-estimate the threshold and say, is it accurate enough? And if it is, say, fine, we won't test that point anymore. If it isn't, we'll find another stimulus, another intensity, present it, and then come back and say, are we accurate enough now? So it's going round this loop okay, all the time until it gets accurate enough. So if you devise a threshold test, you could have one that says, I'm happy with fairly loose accuracy, or I want very accurate measurements. And if you want very accurate measurements, it's going to go around the loop more times. So CETA standard is a more accurate one. CETA fast is a less accurate one. And so CETA fast doesn't have to go through the loops many times, so it finishes quicker, where CETA standard requires more loops. Now in CETA, the accuracy is either CETA standard or CETA fast. It doesn't vary within the test. In Zata, what we say is we probably don't need as accurate a measurement at all locations. For instance, if I present a light that's very close to the normal threshold and you see it, do I need more information? It looks like you're very good, maybe 30 decibels. Am I interested in it being 31 or 29 or 32? Or am I going to say no, 30, it's normal, okay, it's near enough. So what the Henson will do, it will present a light and say, hmm, it's above 30. I'm not going to bother with that point anymore. It's accurate enough. If you miss it, it says, uh oh, something wrong here. I need now to measure that more accurately. It also says that if your threshold is really low, below 10, it probably doesn't need to know whether it's 5 or 6 or 5 or 7, because at that level, the eye is really severely damaged. So it says, I need precision in the intermediate range. I don't need precision in the normal and above range and the severely damaged range. So if you like, it's a bit like switching between CETA fast and CETA standard within a test, 
depending on the results you're getting. And that makes a big difference, particularly in patients who've got normal vision, who don't have a field defect. So you might be monitoring people who've got high pressure, right? who've never had a field defect, their thresholds are all up in the 30s, so the Henson will whip through them, the Zata algorithm, really rapidly, maybe only two to three minutes to do the test, versus five minutes or longer with a CETA test. And it also means in people with a defect, because of the prior measurements being used, it will generally be five minutes or less, whereas it could be seven or eight minutes on a CETA standard test. Is that, that's important, that's presumed with eye fatigue. Yes, because the evidence we have at the moment is that once a test gets above about three minutes, most people start to fatigue and their performance deteriorates. So if you can get the test over and done with in three to five minutes, you're pretty well as best you can. Clearly, the longer you spend, potentially the more accurate the measurement, but I think focusing the measurements on the areas that you're really interested in is important. And I forgot to mention, if it finds a point that's slightly abnormal, it not only accurately measures that one, but it also all the surrounding points. So it treats those, even if they were initially normal, it will measure them with more precision because obviously defects tend to grow 